So about the global trends, I'm not going to ask you to define what is the globalization. It's a very, very broad, uh, broad uh, term and broad issue. But uh, from your position where you are now, let's Martin start with you. What is your perspective on that? Taking into account your great experience in many organizations, you see the world as a whole, and then those small pieces which we call separate countries and regions. What is going to happen? What do we do with all that? Well, if I, um, is it working? If I knew uh, what is going to happen uh, in, in, in 10, 15 years, you know, I wouldn't be sitting here. I'd be very rich. I'd be, I'd be betting and making a lot of money. I mean, we, we don't know what's going to happen in the next 10 years. I mean, did 10 years ago, can we uh, foresee or imagine the advent of the smartphone, the availability of, of uh, purchasing platforms online, um, availability of, um, of, of Ryanair, EasyJet, of EasyJet travel, uh, the, the, the collapse of the, of the air prices. I mean, we couldn't, we couldn't imagine that. So we, we don't know what's going to happen in the next 10 years. Of course, we have um, futurologists, you know, which give us guidance and, and can give us sort of, you know, trends analysis and we can extrapolate from the current trends. But that's the classical mistake that everybody always does is they linearly extrapolate today to tomorrow. And tomorrow is not going to be like today linearly extrapolated. You know, there'll be disruptive innovation. You know, things will go, uh, will go wrong and they'll go right again. But I think in some ways this gives a chance, an opportunity for, for relatively small regions like Vizeme region, which is 200,000 people, you know, which is, you know, a very small village. Uh, you know, there are, there are cities in China, you know, which are 20 million, which we have never heard of, you know, which is, uh, you know, great, uh, great purchasing power and, and potential from there. So, you know, the, the world is, is, is an uncertain place, but we can certainly make a little bit of sense out of it. I mean, we, uh, most of us are from the European Union, and I think that's, that's a great value. Uh, sorry for our British colleagues who are, who are leaving. Uh, they, they will see that life is relatively difficult outside, especially in the, in the first months when that happens. Maybe it gets postponed. Uh, the, the value of the EU is the common market. You know, we have, we have a market of 500 million citizens. And of course, we don't have the customs and, and we can export and import freely. And we have so much gotten used to that. I think Polish and Latvian and Lithuanian enterprises that we don't even sort of consider this as an asset. But it's, it's a great asset. And, and, you know, our British colleagues, which will leave this common market at some point, will, 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 will feel that. Uh, so that's, that's number one. I think that's, that's a great benefit to the Latvian firms and companies. And we can see from, from data that increasingly, even SMEs are, are making good use of, of the single market. You know, there are uh, a small number of SMEs which are, which are exporting still in Latvia, a lesser number than in other EU member states on an average, but an increasing number. There's an increasing number of Latvian companies like Evarts Woods which are selling online, and that's, that's, an, that's an excellent example where you can sort of be local and then sell globally. I think what Ola mentioned, you know, the local buzz and then the global connectivity or global pipeline, I think he, he used that metaphor. I mean, I think a great metaphor they always use is you have your roots in your, in your country, in your community, in your land, but then you have the branches. You know, Latvia is rich with trees, like Scandinavian countries. So we have lots of trees metaphors, but then you have your branches in the world. You, you're able to sort of produce locally in a small uh, shop somewhere in, in, in Aloya or wherever, and then you can sell all over the world via Amazon and other collaborative uh, uh, you know, selling platforms. So that's, that's a great thing. And these, these, these global trends are actually, in some paradoxical ways, uh, empowering individuals and small companies, you know, in the face of these global giants. Of course, the Amazon is the sort of by value the richest company in the world because, you know, it makes the world go round. It's the infrastructure on which, uh, you know, the global trade now happens. But, you know, this globalization can be an asset and can be an opportunity for individual small companies in small places because the world is so interconnected. And I think we've seen that before. I think I'll leave these few comments uh, to start out with, and then we can go from there. Yeah, thank you, Martin. With your permission, I will do make a balance, right? May I sit as well? And you can feel comfortable if Raymond's let us do that. So, and I'm, I'm uh, taking uh, this stuff with me, and you will understand after a while why. But now, let me turn to you, Gina. What about Poland and the, uh, such a 
huge country in comparison with Latvia. Uh, I used to work with the clusters and I was invited quite long ago to Poland um, to give a, like to share now how, how to organize clusters when your government decided that there needs to be set cluster policy to help to go out from the country to become a global. At that time, entrepreneurs were quite self-sustainable. They thought, okay, it's top-down policy. Let's see what we can get out from that. What is the situation now? How you see these global trends are reflected now in your country from your perspective, whether there is a bigger interest to go global and to involve other partners, not just, we are not talking just about export as it was mentioned already. Uh, uh, I agree with you that because uh, it's true that, uh, for example, a few years ago, uh, uh, when we think about the global uh, brands, usually it was a big company uh, which uh, need a lot of time to be a global. Today, uh, in digital economy, it's easier to be a global for SMEs because of the e-channel. You can. Uh, all uh, SMEs can be uh, global, even though uh, when they start to be a, a company, they, uh, they uh, usually think about the global market, because the local market is too narrow, and the, uh, sometimes the, um, mm, the product um, have a so unique, uh, mm, they, uh, they use for uh, small targets uh, in the lo local government in the local market, so they need the, to be a global. For example, uh, I know the owner of the company who um, produce uh, some kind of equipment uh, connected with the sushi. Of course, in Poland, it's not a local uh, food, so they need. Uh, at the start to be a global because the sushi is of course very well known uh, food in all countries so they uh, of course uh, sell it for a, in a global market and uh, of course there is a, some kind of a problem because uh, in a um, project our go smart project we conducted uh, research and um, um, between uh, SMEs, of course, uh, in all uh, project countries, and uh, we ask about the barriers. And the first uh, one was uh, financial barriers, but as the speaker earlier said, uh, there is a lot of funds, organization, uh, which uh, offer uh, money for the SMEs, for internationalization, for innovation, and uh, of course, there's a problem to find those uh, organizations and to, because of lack of knowledge. But the, um, another very important uh, barriers uh, um, from uh, SME's perspective uh, is um, uh, inefficient knowledge uh, how to operate on uh, foreign markets. And in our project, uh, Brokers, uh, well educated, with uh, um, diverse experience from other countries, uh, will participate with the uh, companies who want to, which want to be uh, uh, international. Uh, they participate in all state of internationalization, not only to find uh, when they try to find the partners co for international cooperation, but not only on matching, but also when they should uh, build the trust. Because as uh, Wiesław said, the very important barriers, especially in Poland and in Latvia, because uh, in these countries we, the uh, social trust is very, very low, uh, it's a really uh, big problem and it's big uh, uh, barriers to build the trust. So the brokers uh, will participate in uh, building those trust, building those uh, knowledge about the uh, different phases of internationalization. Thank you. Yesterday, I want to connect with the yesterday a little bit for those who were here and for you as a, for information and for a next point of uh, discussion. We talked about the trust 
not just between the companies, not just between the borders, but also between the sectors like science and the private sector. And then why I was taking this, this is not like in Latvia we said product is Vietoshans reklam by whatever. It's not a replacement of the ad, but this is one of the product from Valmir Moisha who yesterday shared their own story as small SME, really very small one. And the point was that this Latvian Coca-Cola, we call it now, but it sounds much nicer, Kochele, uh, this came out from being in a connection with Andrita coffee makers and the salesmen and having a chat and trying in a kitchen to do something together from our cherries and from coffee, this is also global collaboration. And where I am facing to, uh, how can we uh, help companies to find uh, maybe partners not just for sell uh, their products, but for invention, from, for innovation, scientists and our companies, or our scientists and your companies in your country. Uh, from any, from your perspective, any advice, any thoughts? Maybe, maybe, maybe I can kick off, e even though I'm neither a scientist nor, nor a company. So, you know, I'm, I'm talking on something that is third party. But, uh, but this is indeed a big issue. And this is also a big issue in, in this country where we are in Latvia. Because, you know, you look at any data you, you see and also you look at the practice that there are two worlds. You know, there is the world of science and research and there is the world of business. And unfortunately, these worlds, even though you try to sort of in different ways, you know, using a lot of EU money also sometimes, kind of nudge them together and make them talk, you know, be them on the second floor today or be them at the fora, you know, different types of forums and be it in, in, in sort of competence centers or other types of, of arrangements, which are, which are oftentimes generously spund, funded by the EU money, there's still sort of, uh, there's still lack of common language, we feel, at this country. You know, the business has a, a mentality which is, you know, the scientist, you know, the mad scientist image, you know, he, he, he goes for, for the science, for, for something new, for improvement of the body of knowledge. And then the business person, you know, goes for, for, for profit, you know, goes for, for, for selling things. And, and somehow it would seem like, you know, it's quite a natural sort of marriage that, you know, one would put together the knowledge and the other would put together the sort of the thirst for profit and, you know, there would be something amazing coming out and actually it is. You know, that's where, you know, that's where the most amazing products are being created. You know, the, the iPhones of this world where you have scientists from different disciplines, product developers, neurologists, you know, uh, people from different types of disciplines coming together and developing the products, that's where it happens. But there's still apparently, you know, cultural issues. Uh, apparently there's sort of, you know, the, the, the culture of science and the culture of business have been sort of not developing exactly in sync. Uh, there's all kinds of worldwide experience of how you can, you have technology transfer centers, you have more work in the, in the universities, the sort of the incubators in universities, you have more, you know, the private sector side and you try to sort of uh, actually place scientists for, for uh, you know, some period of time in companies. You know, there's different type of experience. The Brits have a lot of, lot of experience with this. There's a lot of theoretical and practical experience. But uh, I still feel like, you know, we, we definitely need to do more. Uh, data show us that, you know, the proportion that business is spending on R&D in this country is only 1.0.15. That's less than one-tenth of one percent, okay? With that per percentage of R&D investment of business into of business into R&D, you know, you can hardly, you know, Im improve, you know, this climbing of the value chains. Yes, you have good examples of companies here or there, but globally you have 65% of the manufacturers in Latvia are producing in low-tech sectors and only 2% are producing in very high-tech sectors. Yes, in the service industry it's a little bit different. The ICT is developing, you know, by leaps and bounds. Of course, there's a limitation of, of, the, of the labor force. But, uh, of course, with this percentage, and then also in this country, a lot of the R&D investment really comes from EU funds, and there's a lot of dependence on EU funds, okay? The, the, the sort of allocation for, for research and innovation from national budget, aside from EU monies and companies' own funds, is, is relatively minimal. And somehow there is not enough um, 
of the voice, the political voice of, of investing more into applied research uh, in, in this country. So there is a lot of work to be done, you know, in terms of practical advice that, you know, we could give, you know. My organization, luckily, is giving out a lot of different monies, the interregs, you know, it's all EU money, you know, that's really helping. I'm, I'm happy to see the Polish colleagues here, which, have, which seem to have a relatively good idea how to increase the economies of scale, because when SMEs try to sell to China, oftentimes, or India, or bigger countries, oftentimes, they hit the limit of, of volume, you know, they just cannot produce the volume. So if you have a lot of companies producing kind of similar products, you can increase the volume. So it seems like, you know, there's an interesting idea there, but uh, I think these worlds need to be brought more together. And, and in fact, uh, smart specialization is about developing a strategy that doesn't fit everyone, but fits you. So perhaps every company will find a different way how to increase, you know, the innovation proportion but, um, and no one size fits all, you know, there'll be unique solutions. Also different countries have found different ways that work for them, but there are different examples that we could learn from. You know, Israel has done relatively well. You know, US is, is doing very well in, in, in this. UK from EU uh, seems to be doing, unfortunately they're leaving. Again, you know, I, I cannot uh, get over that. Um, so there is, there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, concretely, the firms uh, really need to uh, have a strategy of how to increase the R&D. They need to look at, out for every opportunity that is out there. Uh, there's a lot of good examples, uh, both from the academia side and from the business side. And of course, the government uh, can try to help. And I think to some extent it is helping. But still, the, the thought doesn't leave me that perhaps in this country, in Latvia, we could do a bit better with sort of incentivizing technology transfer and creating the right institutions and infrastructure for that to happen. Right. Yesterday, we really talked a lot about that. But we also, we don't have a, a straightforward solution uh, still for all of these issues. But it's slowly coming to the stage that they are sharing interest, knowledge, and so on, so on. And even such a thing like hackathons are bringing together scientists and, 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 and um, industry guys. So then that might be a, ch a challenge and also a chance to do. But what about Poland universities, Hedarzyna? Can you share, uh, I mean, uh, your researcher's point of view? Are they ready to go out global? Would they be interested to collaborate with, with, uh, with the Latvians, uh, just naming a sector, which one would like to have a partner in the partnership, you know? Because sometimes, sometimes it is quite difficult it could be a language barriers could be a timing could be like everyone wants to have some uh, a special financial source who will support the first step at least right but or maybe it just a need to bring them together just to have a stage where they talk together what is your point of view uh, in my opinion uh, uh, it's a lot of uh, barriers and difficulties to uh, start cooperation uh, because of those trust, because of those lack of money. But uh, I think, uh, as you said, there's a lot of uh, funds, Europeans, uh, European funds, to uh, for the um, which support the uh, uh, international uh, internationalization process processing, but. Um, um, in my opinion, uh, sometimes we should uh, force the both sides, uh, I mean business and uh, academic, to meet and to uh, recognize uh, resources, recognize uh, the, uh, it, to meet each other, spend time and uh, build trust. And uh, if they have uh, the same uh, comparative uh, uh, resources and comparative uh, um, needs, uh, they find a way to be, uh, to co cooperate. All right, and I would like to say that from the first discussion uh, today morning, I want to take it over that probably these global challenges are the real targets to cooperate for scientists in private sector. Climate change, food, health, security, all of that probably is bringing us to collaboration because there are no silos, cannot be silos in these uh, sectors and issues. If it's security issue, it probably goes all over uh, Europe 
European Union and even beyond. So that is our actually kind of uh, point where we, we need to stress out that, guys, there are challenges. Yeah, you have to collaborate with that. But I have to come back to Maxim's uh, questions are coming, and thank you to the audience. And uh, uh, as, as first question came in asking, uh, what inspires you as a businessman to do so many things and not to stop? And can you share maybe on some collaboration cases with the foreign companies, whatever you say you're just selling in the internet, uh, might be that you are not near, uh, lo you were not looking yet for scientists, but any cases with the foreign partners, whether were, they were okay, whether they were successful or not that successful? Who inspires, what inspires you in, in some cases? Kas man iedvesmo, man iedvesmo uh, pagulēt ilgāk no rītiem, jo uh, Kā jau minējis, neesmu izstrādājis ne pie viena, es divus mēnešus nostrādāju pie darba devēju un sapratu, ka mans nepatīk. Un tāpēc sapratu, ka darīšu priekš sevis. Un uh, dienas režīms man ļoti svarīgs, lai es varētu būt uh, tā kā liederīgs, lai viss virzītos uz priekšu un uh, viss notiktu. Uh, Protams, iedvesma arī rodas tajā darba procesā, kad redzi, ka ir radīts jauns produkts un cilvēkiem viņš patīk un viņu pērk. Un, tas tikai motivē tevi ražot vēl un dot, doties uz priekšu. Esmu arī sadarbojies ar zinātniekiem, var, nezinu, zinātnieki tie nav, bet savā ziņā tie arī ir, kas pārzina savas sfēras, pieņemsim, koka kokus visādus, jo pats vispār neko nezināja no kokiem. Pirms sāku ar to nodarboties, biju ceļu un tiltu būvē, RTU, kas vispār pat nav tuvu tam. Un tikai sadarbojoties ar visādiem savas jomas speciālistiem, biznesmeņiem, nākot jautājot, prasot viņiem, kā jādara kaut kādiem mēbeļu ražotājiem, komunicējot ar viņiem, uzinot jaunas lietas un, un, un tie pašiem dizaineriem esmu sadarbojies, lai tā kā, attīstu sevi, lai zinātu, ko darīt, ko cilvēku vēlas. Jā, tā, ka es arī sadarbojos ar All right. zinātniekiem. Un Thank arī... you, and there are a lot of more challenges and, 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 and chances to do that. Uh, and if we come back to, to the point that a lot of things could be done within the country, uh, also global, but then even from the country's perspective, there are regions. In Poland, it's a bit might be easier because you have a bigger regions. In Latvia, it's a smaller regions, yeah. And uh, questions are coming in uh, concerning the how regions could be supported or motivated to go global. Uh, with whatever reason, yeah, and whether it's easy from the regional perspective or it's much easier when you are in a capital, when you are in the center, so you can reach a lot of institutions, you can meet by accident people on the street and so on and so on. You can go to many events, yeah, now you have to drive one hour and a half. If you go to Latgale, you drive even three hours, yeah. So this is the case, but what about the regional perspective? Would you like to add something? Yeah, I saw so pateikt tāpēc, ka es pirms tam dzīvoju Rīgā un kad nolēmu, nu, varbūties kaut ko radošāku, jeb Evert Vūts pārcēlos uz cēsīm, jo saprat to, ka pārdošanai internetā ir pilnīgi vienalga, kur tu atrodies, pat ir labāk, ja tu atrodies mazā miestiņā, jo tad visi tevi labāk zin, viņi tev visu, ko var ieteikt labāk, tas ir viens. Otrs, viss ir lētāk, ir īri lētāka, darba spēks lētāks, Tā pati atbalsts no domas ir daudz lielāks, pieņemsim, Rīgā atbalsts no domas, nu nav iespējams dabūt mazam uzņēmumam, tur kaut ko viņi var pateikt labu un viss, bet cēsīs, viņi piemēr, kāds jautājums ir, uzvanīt, viņi uzreiz tev pazīst un atbalsta. Un tas, ka mūsdienās visi uzņēmumi iet uz to, kad viņi saprot, ka cilvēki slinki, viņi negrib braukt pakaļ nekam, Un visi piedāvā piegādi. Mēs šobrīd mums 99% materiāli un visi tiek piegādāts tieši mums pie durvīm. Mēs nekur vispār neizējam no mūsu ražotnes. Mums visu vienas, visu izdarst, tikai parakstam papīrus un viss. Tāpēc es domāju, 
tas nav nekāds šķērslis, ja tu nedzīvo Rīgā, tu nevar uzsākt biznesu, tu var tieši otrādāk vēl labāk, vieglāk un ārtāk. So region struck and at the end of the day we will talk about the competencies in region. Uh, about Poland region and then I will come back to Martins to you because there are two questions about the European Commission point of view on things. Uh, in Poland, we ha as you said, uh, uh, the region in Poland are rather bigger than in Latvia, but uh, I think it's a, um, the main problem is uh, the leader and owner of the SMEs or the company. If the leader uh, see the uh, border between the region, they also see the uh, border between the countries, between the uh, in the global uh, sense. Uh, but uh, if uh, somebody or the, the leader, the owner, uh, think about the product in a global, uh, um, per, from the uh, global perspective, it's not a problem. I think uh, in Poland the, the, the main problem is the cultural problem because the, uh, the big uh, region, for example, Podlaski region or uh, another, uh, is a different bit, uh, in a cultural sense. So uh, in in Podlaski region, uh, people are less uh, have a less tendency to risk. So, in a international uh, for the internationalization for the innovation is a big problem because they they want to be a, uh, take uh, take risk. They need some mentoring as well yes, for that. Yes. Yeah. So the brokers. Exactly. For exactly. <laughs> Martin, uh, there are questions. Um, Coming uh, to the like, European Commission point of view, what is the EU Commission view on the regional innovation system development capacities of such small nuts three regions as Vidzeme? And in a connection, uh, as we yesterday talked a lot already, that regions are not going so fast, and even Horizon 2020, there are just uh, uh, three places recognized in the, in a, in a top ten uh, from Vidzeme, for example, region, who are applying for this funding or or maybe someone is applying but not getting yet. Uh, is there any future perspective and, and, and potential opportunities for regions? Yes, I, I start with Horizon 2020. Uh, that's obviously an excellence program and it's very competitive. So, you know, obviously there's lots of competition from regions, from universities, from consortia, from all over Europe. And if, uh, you know, uh, if in one case it doesn't happen, there is an opportunity for those who get these seals of excellence also to be funded from national envelope. So there is, there is an opportunity to be funded. Um, in terms of the regional policy, of course, the regions are, you know, the essence. Uh, we, we call it regional policy, you know. Uh, the structural funds are, are, you know, given for regional development so that to bring up the, the level of the regions. Uh, of course, it depends on how you divvy up the country. You know, I think in Poland you, you have, you know, Poland is, is, is kind of... Uh, you know, uh, chalked up, you know, divvied up in terms of regional sense. For EU funds in Latvia, we have all, you know, not two region, all of Latvia is one region, so there's no, you know, further division, so it's, you know, the, the, all the rates are, are the same. Um, of course, in Latvia, we have these planning regions, you know, which have certain functions, and then you, of course, have municipalities, which are the real holders of the real political power, and also a lot of functions. And the questions that, you know, we have asked in our reports, you know, is, is this really has been, effective you know so we've been we've been kind of trying to say that latvia needs to make the next step in the regional reform which the new government uh, to our uh, delight is is, is now uh, taking as a major issue is to make the regions more powerful also in in, in terms of uh, being able to supply projects competitive projects for for funding so that's one of the one of the impetus why why this regional reform is now back on the political agenda um, of course you know uh, there will be development regions. Valmiera is very fortunate because, you know, it had some legacy infrastructure, it has a university, it has, you know, large uh, infrastructure, and, and Valmiera is very successful in, in terms of, you know, making this um, links between the, the, the city and the rural areas. There are lots of other parts of, of Latvia which are not so successful. Vizeme uh, planning region is also not uh, uh, homogeneous. It's a very heterogeneous region. You know, there are some connectivity, you know, some places are better connected than others. You mentioned moving to Tsesis. Yes, there is a trend where people are moving to Tsesis, but they are not necessarily moving to many other places. Maybe Valmir and Tsesis, yes. You know, Gulben, Alux, et cetera, et cetera, maybe not. You know, so there is, you know, also heterogeneity within, within the region. And it's even more pronounced in Latgale and, and, and also to some extent in Kurzeme. Uh, incidentally, Zemgale being so close to Riga, but also, you know, you see regional development indicators are not, are not great. 
even though the EU policy is targeted towards the regions, you know, it depends, it, de it depends on the member state, on Latvia in this case, how it defines its regions. And Latvia has defined itself as, you know, as, as one region. And then, you know, the regional policy then happens within, within the country. So, you know, from, from our perspective, you know, bigger regions, more powerful regions would make sense, you know, would make economic sense. And, and we've discussed this with a number of institutions, the relevant ministry, the Bank of Latvia and others, uh, that we're in support of, of uh, furthering of regional reform to make, to make these regional units stronger and, and more powerful. Actually, I would like to add that talking to the Midsum Planning Region Institution, and uh, as I mentioned uh, this morning or yesterday already, I'm mixing it is, uh, that at the very beginning they were implementing just like three or four uh, interreg huge projects. Now it's more than 35. And with this, they are bringing a lot of foreign competence. They are bringing know-how. They are bringing all these colleagues from, from those countries who share in, uh, information, share experience, share knowledge and then of course that's why I ask you guys to network and to get to know each other and in in our case of course we're a small country but still these regional institutions has become so uh, capable to do so many things and they have a so great capacity and they attracted a very knowledgeable people and that's why we talked yesterday that all these um, uh, knowledge uh, this knowledge should be used for developing a future policy even for such a small country is Latvia, no matter that there are just a few, I mean, the, uh, we are just uh, less than two million, but still a region can have a right to develop a bit different sectors to maybe to specialize more, right? And for Poland, it's maybe easier because you are a big country. For Latvia, it's a bit more difficult, but still we can find some very specific things, right? So that's why maybe involving such a kind active people in policy making process, in a, making um, criteria for next programming period, uh, for a financial, uh, these uh, systems and all of that support system. Are those financial ships already done? Are they still under the preparation? Can be something okay, I was uh, I was kind of expecting when the money question will come, you yeah. know, because you know, talk, 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 and then you know, there's money, you know, and when there's EU, there's money. EU is not just money; it's about the values and you know, common market, but it is also about money. Yes, and uh, so just to just to clarify, you know, how where we are in this planning of the next. I mean, right now, you know, you're benefiting from interregs and whatnot. It's the current planning period. So the next one will start 2021, 2027. We're now currently at the very uh, sort of outset of the planning. Uh, the commission has proposed, uh, you know, its uh, outlook on, on the next funding period. It had allocated provisionally for member states, for Poland, you know, the big billions, you know, the 130 billion or so. For Latvia, it's 4.4.3 billion, okay? Um, you know, it's much, much, much smaller, but the country is also much, much, much smaller. But 4.3 billion is a good, is a good sum. Uh, and so what we're starting today, yesterday, in fact, the European Commission published its investment guidance. So there's the first document, which basically lays out, you know, how from the institutional perspective, the Commission sees the investment priorities in all the member states, in Trialia, in Latvia. So we have five big priorities. One is smart, uh, smart Europe, smart Latvia. The second one is green Europe and Latvia. Third one is social, you know, Latvia and Europe. And then there is uh, connected. And then there is... Uh, Europe and Latvia closer to its citizens, okay? And so closer to its citizens is actually this fourth, fourth, fifth basket is where sort of regional development strategies come into play. And I'm very, very glad to know that, you know, yes, there is the risk three at the national level with the five areas, but then in Vizeme, you know, you have mapped out, you know, where you fit in the risk three, and then you have added on, you know, creative industries and tourism and, and some other areas which makes the region so special. And I really like the Polish colleagues sort of mentioned that in this global world, it's important not to be the same, but it's important to be different, to stand out. Okay, because now you, you really need to stand out and regions need to stand out and what makes them different from other regions and other places is what attracts uh, interest, what attracts foreign scientists, what attracts tourists, what attracts, uh, you know, attracts money at the end of the day, okay, and opportunities and jobs, you know, so, you know, it's encouraged to be different and in this planning period, one of the things which we'll try to do is to have the uh, local development strategies play a more prominent role than before. If before it was more of sort of 
top-down, more national strategy, the ministries, the sort of the, the finance ministry and the regional ministries, the, the, the line ministries, then sort of, sort of deciding really for the regions. Now it's more sort of bottom-up, that regions are encouraged to come up with their own development strategies, and that's what we fund. Because, you know, it comes from the belief that we, we trust the people, we know the people locally know better, you know, what makes them tick, what, 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 where the opportunities are, you know, where the good products, where the good, good projects are, and so that's, that's one of the things. And I'm glad to know, glad to note that, you know, uh, innovative, smart Europe, you know, is number one priority in countries like Latvia. You know, we will be asking to spend more money on smart, you know, maybe less so on, on sort of maybe formal connectivity, maybe less on roads, maybe more on research, applied research which, you know, Estonia has chosen to do, more put more money in science than more in roads. I don't want to make this very simple. This is a very difficult social choice. You know, people are saying we have underinvestment in roads. You know, you need to be connected from Valmiera to Riga, and you need to, that road to be good. You know, we said Raimonds is not traveling because the roads. You know, that's kind of a, you know, what sometimes we, we, we mention. You know, we, we, we blame the roads for people not coming. You know, there is there's certainly investment needs there, as there is in other spheres. You know, social uh, innovation, for instance, um, social assistance, you know, collaboration between services. There's lots of investment needs. But when you really come to see what will be these growth drivers for future, you really need to put the money where the mouth is and put where, and, 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 and research and innovation and application and making the firms more innovative. You know, that seems to me a very logical uh, investment area. And, you know, we'll be maintaining that so that Latvia, you know, whatever the, the development strategy invests in this, this areas, in invests, invests heavily. And there will be money for that. You know, there was some talk that the EU money will not be there, but, you know, 100 and something no, no, billion no. for Poland and for Latvia, I no, think no, there'll no. be quite a bit. It's the quality of investment that we need to focus on. Martin, thank you very much for this inspiration. We didn't want uh, you to name millions for uh, this region and uh, money-wise, but we wanted to hear that probably what we heard, that regions are taken into consideration, they heard, and they are the, the best experts who can say what is needed in region. And of course, just not to make a fun of that, yeah, it just was a joke, maybe Raimonds is too late because of roads, but it's not just that he didn't come because of roads. No, 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 way a road to Valmera is, is quite okay. Uh, we are approaching to the end, but there is a still one uh, kind of tricky question, but I don't want to end up with that question. So I'm going to ask, but still those who are not uh, in a row talking immediately think about the final, what you are going to say, next two steps for today, tomorrow, day after tomorrow. What companies, scientists, universities, NGO, public sector needs to do, whichever you face, one, two, three, to think and to go global. But before that, the question was, any example from any company who, when, when they become international, they fail, and that was like disaster. You can come in with the examples if you have such. SMEs? SMEs or law? I don't believe really that large for companies example, would, would count. Uh, Disney, for example, Taking Disneyland my... in Paris, it was a fail at the beginning because they don't know about the local uh, uh, needs because they, they offer uh, in the restaurant fast food and the French people need wine and time for spending time in uh, restaurants. And at the beginning, there was a fail. After, of course, they improve the management, the, uh, they address the uh, local needs. So, uh, okay. finally, okay. it was okay. Yeah, that's you have to learn before you start, right? Well, I'm normally in the business of sort of praising companies and saying good examples and, and, and best practice examples and where EU money has really helped them and whatnot. So this is sort of the reverse side. Usually the moderators do that to provoke us, you know, to kind of uh, you know, make a more interesting discussion. In Latvia, there is a sort of a proverbial example of this company, uh, Standers. You know, the, you, if, you, if, you have, if you have heard, know, know the fable, you know, it's a sort of a relatively famous company which produced, you know, cosmetics, you know, not exactly bio-cosmetics, but sort of nice smelling, you know, bath balls, you know, which create bubbles, you know, and, you know, you feel all nice and oddly. They, uh, they had some Chinese investment in that, and the Chinese colleagues, um, you know, kind of talked them into going to Singaporean market. 
And then when they in, went into this market, they, they really did not know the market very well. I mean, they, they really put a lot of money in, in there and, you know, the, the, the product, you know, was a lot of competition and these bubbly balls were not really creating a sensation in Singapore. So uh, ultimately, the Chinese took over the company and so it's, you know, still there's some production in Latvia, but it's a Chinese-owned company. In some ways, you could say that this is a story of internationalization. Of course, you know, you try to go to China, you try to go to Singapore, you know, far off places, you don't know markets so well, you have partners there, you know, uh, trust issues again, you know, when you deal, China is a great opportunity, but there's also, you know, don't get me wrong, the Chinese are really shrewd business people for thousands of years, you know, they want the business, you know, not so much, you know, internationalization as a value, maybe. Um, so there, there, are, there are cases where things go wonderfully well, you know, with online sales, etc. There are cases where things, you know, you, you have, um, you know, the F word, you know, you, you, have, you have the disaster. But, you know, when you talk with a, with a CEO of Standards, the ex-CEO, you know, you see that, you know, he has really learned quite a bit from this experience, you know, and he's a serial investor and he's thinking of other businesses and, you know, he's learned his lesson. And I think, you know, other businesses in Latvia may also sort of have learned a lesson or two, you know, if you have followed the story. So there are benefits of internationalization, but things can also go spectacularly wrong. Uh, but it's just what you take out of it, you know, if you don't lose, um, you know, everything that you have, if you still have diversified a bit. So there, there, can, there can be failures. Thank you, Marlin. Always we say we learn from failure as well. Any thoughts, Maxims, on a failure or learning from a failure? Global, in a global market? Or global global īsti es neesmu sastapies, jo pārsvarā, kad viņš aiziet globāli, viņi tā kā, tā kā Disneylanda, viņi saprot savu kļūdu un labo viņu, jo tas ir diezgan problemātiski aiziet uz 100% nepārbaudītu tirgu un saprast to, kad viņi dara lietas savādā kā pie mums un tā ir ļoti populāra problēma, bet, es, bet pārsvarā tas tiek ļoti atrisināts savādāk. Tas beigtos ļoti slikti. Ok, and the next steps, wish for yourself for a, a li, uh, audit, auditorium. So, one, two, three, what need to be done today, tomorrow, day after tomorrow to become global? global. Lai kļūtu globāli, viņamsim nelieli, kautrīgi latviešu uzņēmēji. Es pieļauju, ka viņiem vienkārši jāsāk darboties internetā tā kā man, jo tas ir daudz vienkāršāk un ir jā... Jāmaina nedaudz tās mācības, jo pārsvarā viss tur stāsta, kā tur braukt pie klientiem, tās vizītes sarunāt, zvanīt visiem pēc kārtas. Ka tas, ir, tas ir jau vec, veca metoda, tā teikšu, ir godīgi, jo tā kā man es strādāju pēc jaunās metodas, es pārdodu uzreiz galu patārātājiem, bez starpniekiem peļņi lielāka un jāgi no tā ir lielāka un nav jāieguldās tajā braukāšanā un komunicēšanā. Un šobrīd tā ir diezgan liela problēma, jo, kad es uzsāku pārdošanu, bija ļoti, ļoti grūti atrast kādu speciālistu tajā visā. Bija speciālisti tādi rokdarbnieki, kas pārdeva, bet kas pārdod daudzumā un tā kārtīgi bija ļoti problemātiski. Īstenībā es tev projām neesmu atradis tādu kārtīgu speciālistu, kas zina labāk par mani, ko darīja tajā pieņas mamas zonē, kā lai to sasniedz. Un tas būtu tas solis, kas būtu jādara... Lai virzītos priekšā. Jā, iestādēm, lai virzītos priekšā, lai varētu ātrāk attīstīties okay. un iziet tirgu. Paldies. Mārtiņas? Yeah, yes, undoubtedly. I mean, I think internet is, is great and you can do a great many things there. But, I mean, I'd say if you're a company, uh, pick up a phone and call a scientist. You know, a cousin or, or somebody whom you, you know as a scientist and go and have a coffee with them. I have a nice friend from Morocco, you know, and he, he knows how to do business. And he says he drinks a lot of coffee with people. That's how he finds properties to buy and, and to sell. You know, and I think a simple conversation can be a start of a wonderful relationship. But also it's important to understand that, you know, you as a company or, or a scientist, they, they, they have a bit of a different stimuli and I think a little bit differently. So from a, from a conversation, you know, you can, you can learn a great deal. So if you're a scientist, 
I would urge you, implore you to, to pick up the phone and call a company and see that maybe what you're working on in terms of a scientist can be of interest, not only to the EU or some sort of international project, but also maybe it's applicable in a business sense. And if you're a business, you know, call a scientist and say, look, you know, I would benefit from maybe a bit more knowledge in this and this, just start a conversation. I, I suppose that's it. Of course, I could talk, you know, academically now about having a strategy of internationalization that even Cambridge, you know, had the strategy now and whatnot, but I'd say, you know, the simple thing is to pick up the phone. Pick up the phone. Yes. And uh, for example, our project is an uh, example of cooperation between the uh, between the uh, private sector, between the academic and uh, local government. Because, uh, as you said, as you mentioned, uh, we prepare, for example. Uh, uh, methodology of uh, identification of smart uh, specialization and our local government uh, uh, invite us to uh, to move the to to present the recommendation and in the next uh, 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 time of uh, funding european funding they uh, um, promise us to take into into account those our recommendation from those methodology all right with this if, with your permission, I should wrap up and say, yes, pick up the phone and just make a call, or meet a person and just say what you think, what you wish, communicate. Nowadays, communication channels are not a problem. They are very, very many. You just need to choose the right one, and then you definitely try to meet in person. Probably that is the best way. Nevertheless, internet will help you to get to that end. And let's give a round of applause to our dear experts for all this great time and valuable advices and thoughts. And we will still be together for a little bit. But now, thank you so much from my side and from audience. Thank you. Thank you, Terzina. Podes Maxims, Podes Martins.